Skywalker. Skywalker. Skywalkers. The Dakinis are Skywalkers. The Kanjos would have come, often in their dreams. Dakinis would come in your vision, in the dreams, and show signs uh, and, and decode the hidden teachings. Dokini is a Sanskrit word. In Tibetan we call Kando, Skywalker. Skywalkers, I guess, where they live in the space. Internal space. When we say Skywalker or the walk in the space, means literally meaning, I would say, uh, practicing the wisdom. That's the sword of Guru Rinpoche. Yeah, yes, so before putting here is the sword Guru Rinpoche. So hand goes in, in and out. The hand goes into here yeah. and yes, take the take sword out, out here. from here. Yes. And then they have the sword. Yeah, this one is a sword. This take out to the uh, best form to the country. So this is Excalibur. Yes. There was a prophecy. He will return. It will happen in the age of Akali, the era of degeneration and social chaos, when greed, short-sightedness, and anger possess mankind. When everything falls apart and the people lose hope, he will return. They said that he will come from the West. There is a cave with a hidden sword, the Excalibur of the Himalayas. The prophecy says, whoever finds the sword will be him, Guru Padmasambhava, the lotus-born master, the lotus king, entrusted to herald a new era of Kamalat from his palace of Zandra Pari, and lead the armies of Shambhala in liberating our planet from the samsara of greed, anger, and ignorance. There are secret teachings in hidden valleys, guarded by the Dakini, or Skywalkers, feminine energy spirits that know no limit of time or space. They have left encrypted messages that can only be deciphered by the enlightened ones who have the access codes to multi-dimensional realms. Only they can download these teachings from the universal cloud. Join us on this journey in search of the Lotus-born Master's secret teachings as we seek wisdom from great lamas, research of dedicated scholars, and science from technology innovators and quantum physicists. Join us on this unprecedented expedition following footprints of the Dakini to enter hidden realms that unlock parallel multi-dimensional universes where our world's knowledge is stored beyond time and space in the hard drive of the quantum hologram. Step through the looking glass to log on to the matrix of your mind 
the circuit board that will lead us to a future called Shambhala, as never seen before. Lotus-born master lived in the 8th century. His life is shrouded in mystery and myth. In 2018, Shambhala Studio launched an expedition to follow his footprints across the Himalayas, proving a legend to be true. We discovered his eight manifestations, often depicted in statues, tankas, and mask dances, actually represent eight quantum energy fields. Now, could the founder of Vajrayana, or Tibetan Buddhism, actually be the father of quantum physics? Scientists should look deep into the, the teachings and the manifestation of Guru Padmasambhava as a quantum mechanic theory. Padmasambhava was the father of quantum physics. Guru Padmasambhava was the father of quantum physics. The eight manifestations could be um, different uh, fields within Padmasambhava's um, being. So basically, he manifests in different ways to connect with different energies in the universe. Um, and, you know, he he does that through intention. He sets an intention to be in a specific manifestation, to communicate with a specific energy field. Quantum physics is the very basis of all the modern technology today. Uh, is related to the ancient traditions. It's the ideas underneath the mathematics of quantum physics that uh, have been known by ancient gurus for a long time. Pamas and Baba had already found a way to know the universe and led to the modern theory of quantum mechanics. That is a possibility. The eight manifestations are different levels of possibility. So whether we call this quantum, quantum reality, whether we call it uh, infinite potentiality, whether we call it um, just the realm of pure, pure possibility, I think we can, given our own you know, contemporary language, call that a quantum. Field. The eight manifestations of Guru Rinpoche are eight constructed manifolds that are sequentially reproducible within the internal space that the person develops. All of us have um, eight manifestations. As long as we set the intention to access it, it's all ours. So it is very important manifestation of Guru Rinpoche is Lodi Tulu. Among all the manifestations, there is one most important or the last manifestation which is called Dorje Trulu, the riding on the tigers. Dorje Drolo. So when Dorje Drolo is manifesting in this very extraordinary way, riding on the back of a pregnant tigress through infinite clouds of space and time. And the Kando Tashi Kidin, the Dakini consort of Guru Masaba of Bhutan, manifested into tigress. Dorje Drolo seems to be surfing on the back of you know, his consort, you know, Tashi Tridun, the Tibetan consort who manifested as a tigress in order to transport him to, uh, to tiger's nest. The tiger is the, you know, like the most powerful, most fearsome. There's nothing more unpredictable than a pregnant tigress. It's the most dangerous plaything. Writing Guru Pamasama on the tiger means that Guru Mbuche have conquered all the fears. To be able to ride on the back of a, ti of a tigress is essentially showing that you are mastery of phenomena, the phenomenal world, and that means of the quantum dimension. Therefore, quantum physics begin in Bhutan.
Dorje Tolu is one of the manifestations of Bema Sambhava, a specific for Kali Yoga time. In Kali Yoga time, there's we humans, negative emotions, proud and jealousy and greedy. That destroying self and the others, even that destroying the world, global. I mean, look at the world around you. All the hate uh, activities that are happening, all the deprivations of some societies and some countries and how the rest of other people are ready to inflict any kind of disasters. The general public really don't have a say or the power to access. Uh, and I think that is aspects of the Kali Yoga. The negative emotion is the devil. Negative emotion is the demon. Negative emotion is destroyer of self and others and gobbles. But this is the de degenerate age. In spite of all the advancements we've made in technology and science. The amount of information in particular is such that the force of negativity is unlike I think it's ever been. You know, Silicon Valley, I think about Silicon Valley. Here are all of these tech companies with a huge role, tremendous potential to use that for good. And there's also the same potential to use it in a negative way. The greedy become million, million, million times more power because help of technology. We have kind way of to serve to others. The technology will help tremendous. So technology is medicine, technology is poison. Now, nowadays, people have not really like fully give up for dharma, fully giving for the money, name, power, it's like that. The greed, anger, and the ignorance. All this is all this is predicted, and I feel this is coming, coming true. Well, Lord Buddha has clearly prophesied the coming of uh, Guru Rinpoche. He will be born from a lotus, in a, from the ocean in Odiana. If Guru Rinpoche would come back and tell us specifically that this is the problem, maybe people would sit up and listen and say that nobody is different from anybody. Everybody's action, you know, has the same negative or positive impact on the world. In future, there will come a time when the teachings of Buddha would be all diluted. It will not be there. And at such a time, the true teachings of Buddha and Guru Rinpoche will come from the time. It will all be stored here, so it will be you know, revealed, and then the teachings will come back. The age of Shambhala begins in Buddha, here in Buddha.
there was Gurdjieff Vache, and he said, all that I have realized is gonna be important in the centuries to come. He encoded all of these various different practices and made it possible for people in the future to discover them, to reveal them. He hide the teachings for the future. Because he has a lot of energy, then he hide those some um, his teaching in earth, in space, in water, and yeah, many places. The scripture which is written by Guru Muche and that are revealed by Tertans are called termas. Termas are something that um, Guru Rinpoche is believed to have hidden, uh, to be rediscovered by people that he has chosen at a degenerate time. And so the terma are categorized generally in two forms. One is called the sater, these are the earth treasures, and the other is the gong ter, these are the mind treasures that are described by tradition as having been implanted into the mind stream of his 25 disciples during his own lifetime. So termas can come in many different forms. There are the physical ones, you know, which are basically artifacts that have been hidden by Guru Rinpoche. And not just Guru Rinpoche, I think the 8th century Guru Rinpoche also sought the help of all his disciples, mainly the, you know, close 25 disciples. Guishi Tsojo and other 25 disciples, they went to different places in Tibet, different places in entire Himalayas. So they have hidden important secret teaching of Guru Padmasambha to various different places, mountains, rivers, caves, everywhere. It's hidden in rocks, it's hidden in lakes, all kinds of water bodies. It's hidden in a physical sense, but it's also hidden in sort of the cloud, you know, more space. Uploading his wisdom realization of non-duality into the cosmic server. You could call it uploading a certain um, protocol. The rituals basically would allow you to create coherent energy, collection of coherent energy and be able to store it. Anything could be stored in the universal cloud, including music, including sound. So that is fundamental and that is universal. We used to call the unified field space-time, but that is not very accurate. A better term for it is space-memory. That the cosmic server is located somewhere in time and space. It literally is vibrational patterns imprinted in space at a geo-coordinate. Well, the most fundamental thing about the universe is wave and particle, of course. So um, everything has a frequency. The universe is collecting everything. That's analogous to what's called the Akashic Records. And the Akashic is an Indian word, it means sky. So sky, cloud, Akashic Records. Akashic Records is, is a library of the vibrational signature of everything that exists anywhere in the universe and every thought that has ever happened. Everything in the whole universe that ever happened, every thought that's made, every intention that's intended is stored in the universal consciousness. That's where collective uh, unconsciousness comes from. You know, there is no way for us to have that collective unconsciousness unless there is a storage system in the universe that's um, beyond the individual's individual time and space. The timeless aspect of this informational space there's no space and no time in information space because it's not described by space and time. Space and time come out of the transformations that you do to get from information space into space time. For the biocomputer, i.e. the brain, the visible brain, the EEG space, in combination with the mind space, which is not measurable up to now, together constitute the biocomputer.
we have long thought that we hold information in our brains, you know, that our memories are, are in our neurons. And science, scientists like, have actually had a difficult time finding where we're storing these memories in the brain. So the biocomputer is capable of entering the portal, of reconfiguring into a form that can access, for example, what you are calling the record. We're starting to, to believe that the brain functions more like an oscillator. So it's, 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 it's more like a radio receiver and a radio transmitter. And our memories are stored in the unified field. Guru Padmasambhava's secret teachings were encrypted by his consort Dakini Yeshi Sogyal and stored in the waters, mountains and clouds for future generations to discover. The Turtons are prophet revealers who can decrypt the codes, but they can only do it with the vibrational frequency and help of a Dakini. So to search for the teachings, we had to follow footprints of the Dakini. Tertans are the revealers, discoverers of the dharmas, the, the hidden teachings and hidden treasures. Decoder is the Tertan. You know, we believe in the five great inner captains that chants. Lama Wan Nandanyang, Guru Chiwang, Doji Limba, Pema Limba, and Pema Yusuf Donga Limba. This is the five, it's very famous. And the most famous Tertan is Pema Limba. We can talk about Tertan Pema Limba, who's closely associated with Bhutan. He's a Bhutanese, he was a Bhutanese. And um, the thermos that he uncovered were also, you know, there were many forms, but they were physical ones too. He found the teaching in the member so. The member so is uh, actually located in Tang Valley. And for Buddhists uh, who believe in the Deptans, the treasure discoverers, it has great significance. He was challenged by the then local leader, leader saying that we hear that you're a treasure revealer. And, uh, and we want you to do a public revelation to prove that you are a treasure revealer. So Pema Lingo was compelled to jump into this ravine, went into the lake, dived in, and came out with Patalam still in his hand and a statue. This was really to prove that um, he was in fact a treasure destined treasure revealer, a manifestation or a reincarnation of Guru Padma Sambhava. Bumtang is also a very spiritual land. In Bhutan, it's supposed to be a more spiritual place. When you've been to Bumtang, the Pema Lingpa went to the water. Water, particularly when it's structured, it holds information. Water, it is again represents the wisdom. For a long time, thought about water as possibly being one medium for the Akashic records. It's possible that the water is a metaphor 
for the matrix. And if the matrix shifts, everything shifts with it. Because every single thing has an energetic signature associated with it. Every single thing has a geometry. And, if, and that can then alter the medium within which it sits. And the water then becomes like a supercomputer, you know, a, that's going to, to register the, the geometry that is imprinted within it. Thoughts can be imprinted in, in the unified field, can be imprinted in water very, very easily. Dertens also relied quite a bit on Dakini principle. Characteristic of the Dakinis are they are the wisdom holders. So they are very important for realizing, I think, realization of whatever wisdom there is to be had. A country is entrusted with being the guardian of that treasure. And so the, the yum, the the country is very important to unveiling the treasure. So you need the help of Dakinis. The Tertin must have Dakini to find the Dharma. Dharma tradition, I think Dakini is key. Kando the tap kachulo the serap gichani serap. Tertin kora tap gicha. Kanda kando the serap bendi ki tap dan serap sungju jushile. Tap dan serap ni zomshile matuchi bo. Tertin kachira ni kachulo terin ni kachiru. Without wisdom, nothing will work. That's why Dakini, I mean, have to have. Only through Dakini power can Tertin find Dharma. Tertins mostly have the concert. Because uh, the main holder of the therma is Dagni. So Tertin has to connect, has to get help from the Dagnis because that mostly the treasures are protected, are taken care of by the Dagnis. No Dagni, no Dharma. control To receive, get the therma. The Dardo needs um, the help or a guide, guide of a Kanduma is a guide, sort of. Without the Kanduma, he, the Dardo will not be able to find uh, the Dharma. The Dardo needs the Kanduma to help uh, receive the Dharma. Feminine uh, consort acts also as a tuning fork at a higher frequency. So basically, the female uh, consort activates the female energy within um, the, these people so that they could access the unconscious mind to access that information. Coming from the ancient Greek mythology, we have this idea of the muses, which are female in the mythology. And artists have through the centuries, through, through millennia in fact, been referring to the need to have this female inspiration contact with the muses in order to create. Kandra is Dakini, Daik is, I think, like a code. Kandra Daiks are basically believed to be writings from that era when Guru Rinpoche was um, sort of hiding his dharmas. Uh, many believe it's the writing of a Kandra, so the name Kandra. You know, Da is a sign, Yik is letter, so. Da means like this, the sign, you know, so there's some kind of indication there. It could be a one page written book or, or written teaching. Guru uh, but it will be written in Dakini letters. And Dakini letters are that it's condensed, or teaching is condensed into in a few words or a single page. So that's that Dakini has a special letter, sign, 
so not not everyone can understand. Kandu dail hamni gi dunlo yanchin ta ta guru mochi mochi de guru mochi di kusung to gi chingil lam lapchi. Te yanchin ta rana sosu gi gom yamling gi thole be te jungo bi te nani be yoga chin te ne kandu gi da dai di so te te tunchi imba chin ta di pecha kandu bara taru te tunchi member chi kandu dail hamni. It's basically writings in code that were hidden. Triggers the mind of the treasure revealer, and then things would come out. Even just one symbol of Dakini script unlocks in the treasure revealer's mind the entire teaching that is contained within it. And so, that these are these are the passwords that allow the treasure revealer to download the entire treasure of wisdom. Code. So you have to, uh, when the, the master, the treasure revealer, or Tertun, when the time is ripe, right, and all the circumstances are right, and then he or she may de uh, decode. Kandu Daik or Dakini script. It's a letter. It could be just a few sentences that will unravel or can be decoded into an entire volume or several volumes of text. When you have the key, you have access to the whole trove of information that underlies it. That's what we understand of it with traditional encryption. That there was one Dakini script in Tibet which was not revealed. And they asked Jabji Dingu Kenzir my grandfather, whether he can reveal that. And then Kenzir Mbuche looked at it and he said, OK, it's just one small page. Uh, he said he will try, and then he went to uh, a shrine. There was a very sacred shrine. It's called uh, Stupa there. So he went there, and then he asked for uh, uh, one cup of uh, alcohol, nectar, and he put some blessing pills in it, and he put the green script into the into the water, and then he was doing his practice. And time to time he would just peep in it. It's covered with cloth. He, time to time he peep in. And then when the time was right, he just opened that and then he asked them to bring a paper. And those days, papers are not very uh, uh, common, uh, valuable in Tibet. So they had uh, 40 uh, sheets of paper uh, ready to be printed, ready, ready to be written, you know. And Kensington Mishra wrote exactly 40 pages. And he says, uh, you gave me 40 pages, I wrote 40 pages. So if there's more than 40 pages, I think there's more he could elaborate. If there's less, he could have done less. So they gave him 40, he wrote 40. And then after that, the, that paper, all the uh, writings on the script, it disappeared. Scripts um, contain energy. So every word that's written in writing form also includes that energy. I think maybe the stream of consciousness is when he could access the form of the word and it um, basically activated the meaning and basically you know, gets him into that um, stream of coherent energy. So that is what we call the Shokser, uh, Dakini script. And also another story was that uh, when Kensington Bhutti visited uh, one holy site in Tibet, Dharmapala room, the protector room. And uh, his attendant, they saw that something falling down, falling down from the, the sleep of the Dharmapala. And they thought maybe some kind of mice or something pushed something, but some kind of paper rolled down. And Kensington Bhutti picked up and he looked at it. And based on that uh, script, Dakini script, Kensington Bhutti wrote down the whole circle of Pajakilaya practice, one whole volume. Each Tetan have a different style. I remember asking Kensington Bhutti, if it's all downloaded from Kensington uh, mind, how come it's, they have their own different style? So Kensington Bhutti's answer was that, uh, that when the moon reflects in the lake, according to the cleanness of the lake, that you will start seeing a different kind of reflection. So likewise, the different Tirtan, their own style, somehow they receive the message, and then when it comes out, it comes in their own kind of particular style. I've seen writings that are considered to be Kandudaiks, or letters from uh, the 8th century or Guru Mishra's time. This is Dakini script 
that just recently was rewritten for a specific project that I'm working on, which is the publication of the collected works of the great Dakini Sarakandro, who lived at the turn of last century from 1892 to 1940. And she was a treasure revealer herself. On top of that, I think there's a Dakini script there, Yes. Which is um, written in a yellow piece of paper. And it was written in such a way, it's like a code. So you have to, uh, when the, the master, the treasure revealer, a third turn, when the time is ripe, right and all the circumstances are right, and then he or she may de uh, decode the code. It must have been a co combination of letters that were available at that point. Think of a microchip. All the information on your smartphone and computer is stored on a tiny chip, no bigger than your fingernail. It holds a vast amount of information. Now think for a moment. Is it possible that in the eighth century, encryption was already mastered by yogis and yoginis on maybe an even higher level? It's only accessible to the Turtan with the help of a Dakini. The Dakini, Kandro Yeshi Sogyo, was the Tibetan consort of the lotus-born master. She was responsible for writing down his teachings and encrypting them into an undecipherable script that would be decoded by master Turtons in the years and centuries that would follow. Is it possible that Kandro Yeshi Sogyo was the first cryptologist, making her the mother of Silicon Valley, as well as many of the hidden realms in Bhutan today. Since it's hidden by Yishi Sogyal, there is the letter written by Yishi Sogyal, which is written in Dakini secret court. Yeshi Sogyal's script. It's written by Yishi Sogyal, of course, but there were also, there were also other, the other 24 court disciples who could have contributed to it. So then she's a very, very compassionate when Guru uh, Rinpoche speaks out and he's the right, she's writing down for the future, future very important. She had her own code and her code is called the Dakini script. Uh, Kandra Daik apparently cannot be hacked into. It just it is transferred that way through different times and space, um, perhaps, but it's not open to hacking or it's not hackable. Modern days, what they call it's called iPhone or phone. You have to upgrade, right? Every month, they're upgrading, right? Same thing. Guru Mboche, he upgrade his teaching in like 8th century. Hello? Hello? Now you would never believe where I am. I'm 4,000 meters above sea level in the land of the king. No, 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 between the feminine energy and the uh, quantum gravitational field as the, the field that is hosting all of space. How information that is hosted by the quanta of these quantum fields is only accessible through interaction. Uh, then in order to access this information, one needs to be able to make those specific interactions with the quanta that are hosting the information, uh, and that requ either requires special equipment uh, or it requires a special skill to be able to access this information.
This is Garuda with the mandala that represent outer and inner and secret mandala. This is Vajra Kilaya, magic dagger. This is very important object for the karma. This Vajra Kilaya is like the key to open the thermos. Tibetan Buddhist ritual practice is powerful. If you practice properly, then of course this can be the main source of all the energies. Allows you to explore the limit, really. I think the Vajrayana method is it's like a high-tech meditation. This is a weapon. What's it, what's it used for? Yeah, you could call it that. Pala Sambhava's iPhone and also transmitter is not just a receiver, it's also a transmitter of his energy. In the times of Padras Baba, you're looking at the transmitters that were being used, you know, these, these devices, these daggers that were made out of metals, gold, silver, uh, copper, right? These are, for that time, the most technologically advanced conductive materials. What are you destroying with this? I think he uses his dagger not to hurt people, but to transform energy from a negative to positive. Positive tensions put into these sound waves that travel out into the universe. Basically driving a positive intention into the energy field. So that energy field is converted into a positive energy field. So the purba could be also understood to be, yes, in the, in the, in the Tibetan tradition, the Excalibur of the Himalayas. And so, for example, there's the story at, uh, at Chumpuk of the, the sword. Is it the flaming sword of, of Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom? Or is it the Purva? Now, this is also very key because it ties us right back to, to Taksang, to Tiger's Nest. And the actual cave of Dorje Drolo um, at uh, Tiger's Nest is opened only on one day a year in early July, according to the lunar calendar. They open this gilded gate, and when you enter into that cave, which is where Padmasambhava actually practiced and manifested uh, as Zorjadrola, what you actually have is a mandala of, of purbas, of, of ritual magical daggers in all shapes and sizes. It's the most extraordinary place. And there are purbas there encased in rock there, and you're surround, you're in a mandala cave, you're in a womb. There he is rolling, rolling the ritual dagger. Right, he's got it right there. He's rolling it. The purba, just like this. And although it's shown here as static, the practitioner would take the purba out from his belt and roll it between his hands, doing the mantra om So by reciting the mantra, Om Kila Kila Kilaya Sarve Vigyana Benzo Hum Pe. This Pe is the key thing. So the mantra is like an encoded energetic vibration. Why are fantasy movies so popular? Lord of the Rings, all of it. People, people love fantasy. So in some ways, yeah, why not fantasize about Vajra Kalaya? Filling the universe with this huge Purva dagger and you can just like, his whole body quivering, just rolling it back and forth, you know, just like getting ready. I mean, you can like <laughs> really start. And then when you understand that is smashing your belief in yourself 
as being true and beyond all the all the clinging you have then to me and what's mine and what I like and what I don't like and what you know makes me uncomfortable here and you know what makes me feel anxious that, you know the whole thing starts to collapse that that's Vajrakalaya Uh, by the practicing of the Vajrayana, we can see the world as a lock and the purpa as a, a key to unlock it. There's a key in that. Introduce your mind, nature. That's the key. That any one individual has full power to shift the experience of one's reality. And the treasure is inside. Because nothing does truly exist, anything, everything is possible. To open the key, once open the door, you realize, and that is so you are fully awakening. And this is like the map, and that is like the key. On this Shambhala expedition, we came to Bhutan in search of the terma, or secret teachings, of the Lotus Born Master that had been concealed in the universal hologram by his consort, Yeshi Sogil, in the 8th century, to be discovered in the future by the Turtons, or treasure revealers, who can only decrypt the codes through the help of Dakini, who hold the passwords protectively. These teachings are said to be locked in servers stored in hidden lands or multi-dimensional parallel universes. To reveal the teachings, we had to find the access codes to the hidden realms of Bhutan by following footprints of the Dakini. Dakinis, you can see, there's many lines, you know. The Dakinis not just walking, but just flying. Guru also in the Taksan, which means he flew from here to Taksan. So these exact same handprints are within the Taksan, the tiger's nest. Yes, yes, yes. Hand here, Guru Rinpoche put hand here, and then he flew from here. He flew from here? Yes, yes. So Guru Rinpoche. See. What do you say? Guru Seng, Guru Rinpoche. Eight years old, she took just footprint. This is her footprint. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Right and left. Right and left footprint. Uh -huh. She took just eight years old. This is the Dakini footprint. Uh -huh. The actual Dakini footprint. Here. Yes. This is the crystal door here. It's the spiritual teachings. Spiritual treasure. The teachings are there, hidden oh, there, and sealed by Guru Pema Sambhava and Yishi Soja. And this door is made of? It's oh, made of white it. crystal. Yeah? One must have the power to go to not just to one dimension, but all other dimensions. Usually in the Himalayas, uh, uh, holy, holy sites usually have these crystals and, and many other precious gems which we refer to as Norbu. Crystal is the key to open the dimensions. Crystal is clear, so likewise mind is clear. Because crystal is pure. Primordial purity, which was really in the Dzogchen traditions of Baba Sambhava, the expression of emptiness was pure potentiality. Crystals have this characteristic of, on the one hand, being pure, and maybe also you can see through. 
or it opens up to something, like something beyond um, the surface that you're looking at. If you shine the light again through a crystal, then you could return it to white light again. When the crystal uh, hit by the sun, sun, and then the, the rays will come up. So our thoughts will appear even uh, uh, clearer. You can see the rainbow patterns. And so just, it's that which is the metaphor for one's own mind and the true nature of mind. And crystal doesn't have a color. So if you put in the white cloth, it becomes white. If you put on the blue cloth, it becomes blue. So likewise, outer circumstances can change your state of your mind. The geometry of the molecular arrangement dictates the shape of the crystal. I guess you could call it a technology, you could call it nature. Nature of crystal, its optical qualities is, is unique. You've got a highly organized molecular arrangement. It can keep interference from outside off. Crystals are highly structured and they hold information. Breakthrough came in 2017 when China launched a satellite. And the unified field is exquisitely structured and it holds information. Chinese scientists were able to send that satellite into space and created quantum communication over long distance. So crystal um, itself vibrates at over 32,000 hertz, which is extremely high. I believe that's part of the reasons why crystal is used. A crystal will have a kind of a resonance with a particular dimension. What is unique about quantum communication is that it is unhackable. Crystal allows us to access our inner um, mind, inner subconscious mind. That's why we offer crystal to the Dakinis. So that's what the energy of Dakinis is. The energy of Dakinis is to introduce you to the nature of your own mind so that you recognize it to be exactly what it is. To introduce students to the nature of mind. With the Dakini power, we can open the dimensions. Then I think you're open to the other dimension. In general, whole Bhutan is supposed to be a Bayul, and then within Bhutan we have special Bayul, a real Bayuls. So there are many such Bayuls uh, in Bhutan. The Bayul is like a hidden land, and it is protected uh, so that the, the evil force will not uh, interfere. The Guinea is to help uh, protect, help push, uh, spread the Dharma, and then also to protect from the, in the wrong hands being falling into the wrong hands. So these are the main uh, Dakini's kind of job or responsibility. It is a hidden valley because no one can get access to that uh, valley. So a hidden land, from my understanding of the tradition, these were places that Pambasambhava designated uh, on a physical level as places that one through extraordinary difficulty could actually reach. That place usually is very foggy. And then uh, you go into the, the fog, 
and then suddenly you can reach a beautiful place. And then next time you will not find that. Padmasambhava's hidden lands as being kind of parallel dimensions. Multiple universes happening simultaneously. So it looks like some kind of parallel universe. I think that the possibility of many parallel universes and realities is just as feasible as saying, um, you know, that out this window there are rice patties. We could access the other worlds, the hidden worlds, if you will, um, using our subconscious mind and not our physical senses. One way the hidden lands are described uh, within the Tibetan tradition as places where the physical world and the spiritual world intersect. So when we look at what that actually means in terms of our experience, it's a place that we can enter and still see the trees, the rocks, the waters as we would experience in ordinary life. But there's this interpenetration of that by a kind of energy field, which is why it often happens that we're in what's designated as a hidden land where things start to happen. There's an increased synchronicity, for example, auspicious coincidence. Things start to happen in ways that wouldn't seem to be ordinarily predictable. At any point in which the person steps outside of their usual mind box, uh, epiphenomena happen, or at least there is an openness to epiphenomena. So Chumbuk is an extraordinary uh, hidden land, but what's extraordinary is to making the pilgrimage into this hidden land of Padmasambhava, you pass through a portal between stones, the whole way up you're passing extraordinary markings within the landscape, which are sometimes the eye of a Dakini, uh, sometimes it's a, a place where Padmasambhava's horse had been tied in the past. You have waterfalls street that are representing streaming of the central channel. So all these mimetic devices within an extraordinary subtropical environment that are invoking the potentiality uh, that we have within us to transform the way we see ordinary reality. So when we look at this, this same narrative of the once and future king as it applies to Padmasambhava, we see the hidden land of Chimpu in Bhutan, for example, where there's this story of a sword in a stone, which is also central to the story of King Arthur. And there's the same idea that only the one who will be able to lead our current kind of chaotic civilization, only the one who draws out the sword uh, will be the one who opens the gateways, as it were, to Shambhala. The whole practice of Shambhala can be understood as one way of um, reaching the Buddhahood enlightenment through the inner practice which might look like, when you read it, it looks like a place, isn't it? But then, there are also some explanation that Shambhala is a place. Uh, and then, the, when the, like you said, when the time comes, the king Rigden, Rigden, will, when the, when the whole uh, world, our world is uh, conquered by the, the barbarians, and when the time is right, and Rigden will come with the the iron wheel. And he will lead the army of Shambhala. Uh, in order to see Shambhala, it's not necessary to uh, go away, to, to walk from where you are. If you have the merit to see Shambhala, the Shambhala is right in front of your eyes. So it's not that there's any place other than right here, right now, where we need to go to find Dakas and Dakinis and the entire mandala of wisdom phenomena. In some sense, a gateway into the quantum reality. Because to enter into a quantum reality, to experience it, even the, if you will, the, the tentacles of it, means going beyond, leaving the rational mind behind. Opens the door of perception that we didn't have before. That what we are experiencing is just one possibility of numerous possibilities that are unfolding. 
So these hidden lands are kind of radiant fields that are portals into another dimension of experience. Wormholes is uh, when time, space collided. They're, they're a singularity point where time and space do not work as Einstein's theory of relativity applies. Because in that singularity, the laws of physics doesn't apply. Just as Alice in Wonderland also is a, is a narrative that has analogies to quantum physics. And one of the great iconic rock songs, I would say, of the 1960s and 70s was, was uh, Jefferson Starship's White Rabbit. White Rabbit invokes Alice's adventures in Wonderland. And it, you know, it's, it's one of the great classics of, of, of psychedelic rock. But if I recall some of the lyrics offhand, it's, you know, when logic and proportion um, have abandoned you, you have entered into the, it's all, and the rhythmic pulse, almost the pulsation of the way that that song actually begins to play is about being able to take Alice as a guide, as it were, into a parallel reality. The hole that Alice goes through can be seen as an analogy to a wormhole in in space or, or even uh, into a different mode of consciousness. My understanding of a wormhole is, uh, is an extreme distortion in space-time that allows one to traverse from one region of the universe to another distant region of the universe. So you can you can ignore the normal physics rules, for example, about time and space and travel to another space-time. That's, that's a theory. In quantum physics is that scientists have also observed that articles actually travels back in time. So, so there are some interesting things going on here. Splits of universe and traveling forward and, and back in time. Loop quantum gravity theory as poses the idea that space and time might be granular. Uh, the importance of this is that once we shift our mind from one mode of conceptualizing space of time to another mode of conceptualizing space and time, marvelous things may, may happen. In Buddhists, uh, we use sometimes the Tusum Tume, past, present, future, and then the beyond time. And I think uh, even with the modern science, they can, they know the time really don't exist according to I think Einstein's theory, isn't it? So all the perception, I think is not really as real it seems to us. But uh, the real meaning of this temple is the get place where all the Dakinis gather to unlock the encryption of Dakinis' secret court. Dakinis in the kingdom of Bhutan, and there are many Dakini secret caves. Around the entire Bhutan, there are many caves. But one of the most important cave is above this mountain. There's called 100,000 Dakini gather to receive teaching from Guru Pama Sambhava. And they make it, create a mandala offering to the Guru Pama Sambhava. So they're called 100,000 Dakini cave above the tiger nest. And Guru Pama Sambhava give the most highest supreme teaching to all the 100,000 Dakinis. Really? Rinpoche, will you take me there? Yes, we are going. We will go there now. Okay. <laughs> So 
So it's called boom, meaning 100,000, drug meaning the place, the, the cliff. So 100,000 Dakinis used to stay there, used to meet there. So that place is very sacred. And then there's a temple on the uh, cliff and it ha used to have uh, the handprints of 100,000 Dakinis. So Bumdra, uh, which is up on the crest of the mountain on which the tiger's nest is located. So one goes beyond the, um, there's a trail that goes up above tiger's nest that very few people take called the Naljor Lam, the yogi's path. You could say the hidden land that Taksang in a certain sense is just the portal into. And this is extraordinary because when you take what's called the yogi's path, uh, you're actually entering into the feminine principle, which is really at the heart of Tantric Buddhism, because hidden lands are also described as, as, as yonis. They are the creative, they are the womb. That womb space, which is, to me, that darkness where you have, if you have a black hole or complete nothing, then um, something comes to suddenly manifest everything. And that can happen both entering into the physical landscape of the hidden land, but it also happens by, with the right consort, we are suddenly transformed. Our own egoic self is dissolved into this field of pure potentiality, which is the vibratory energy of the divine feminine, which can be encountered through the sexual yogas, through the karma mudra practice in, in tantric Buddhism. The highest practice of Vajrayana is the female practice. That is Dakini practice. There's female energy, and then there is the female in a, on a very humane, mundane level. There's also the female concerts of a lot of the Buddhist teachers, who are also known as Khandro. Dakini is the one who holds, like the key, to enter into the therma uh, teaching of Guru Padmasambhava. The treasures reveal the dead ones, and they have a concert for, in order to reveal that. I think it has something to do with what we call tap and share the method and wisdom. A male and a female, they, they are a symbol of wisdom and method. Ka is the spaciousness, emptiness, and then do is the skillfulness. Kandu itself is a union practice. There's a principle that is represented by the male, skillful means. There's a principle that is represented by the, the woman, which is wisdom, space, emptiness, the prajnaparamita. Right? The, the perfection of wisdom, the great empty nature of all that appears and exists. And so if you, as a sole individual practitioner, can realize the non-duality of those two, you don't need a consort. But relying upon a consort is one way of realizing. The, the union of polarities. Well, we know of Einstein's most profound uh, contribution was his theory of special relativity, E equals mc squared, pronounced in 1905, where that energy and matter actually are equated. And again, they're, they're expressed very differently, like the white and the, and the black, the, the, the feminine and the masculine, but they give each other shape and meaning. And the, in fact, there isn't one without the other. It's even like if you look in all the computer, the methods all based on both positive, negative, positive, negative, isn't it? So there is always some kind of both aspect has to be there. All information uh, on any machine is uh, read and written in order of zero and one. Every letter translates to a number, but then every number, even 59, can be broken down into zeros and ones, a positive and negative. 
uh, and that is how information is stored into uh, uh, memory chips. There is also quantum computing, which has all the in-between possible positions beyond one and zero. And this is why the future quantum computers could be so powerful. We're not talking about just zero one when we have quantum computing. Duality is just our interpretation of the world because we tend to look at things as black or white, you know, one or zero. Or I think some people, they use like yin yang energy. Yin and yang is the basis of human potential expansion. Female energy, male energy will have this yin yang combustion energy that will be explosive. The combination of female and male en energy causes the activated energy level that elevates the energy so that it could vibrate at a higher frequency. The sexual experience, when it's approached from a tantric perspective, it is the blending of masculine and feminine energies and a reaching of a much higher vibrational state than you can achieve on your own. Consort practice. And the consort practice is not just a, a, a man finding a woman who's receptive and doing the practice. It's a union. It's the practice of the union of the male and the female in the bliss state while actualizing the state of emptiness internally. Bring the masculine and the feminine energies together. And when you bring them together and they combine, they create a non-duality. And that non-duality is transmuted into pure creative force. A sudden insight that comes or sudden wisdom that you receive, whatever that energy is, it feels like you pull down from the ethers is what I think of as the Dakini energy. Hinduism, amongst all the religion we're discussing, is the oldest, and they had Dakinis. And within their context, Shakti and you know, others, um, it is an energy that was considered very powerful, positive energy, a protective energy. These female characters in the Hindu tradition, they, they belong to Kali. Kali representing this ultimate destruction depth of, of perhaps what we in physics could call the, the black hole, uh, where everything just disintegrates and, and destroys. Well, feminine energy is, is very strong. And uh, these quanta of space uh, are describing gravity and, and, the, and the, the, the powerful forces of the universe. Forces, in fact, that can be so powerful, they form entities such as a black hole, where space-time or the quanta of the gravitational field are so curved and so distorted, not even light can escape their force. If we think of uh, now Kali as analogous to the black hole, and the uh, diaconies as being peripheral to that, jumping back to quantum physics, one of the most recent fields of quantum physics looks into gravity. Uh, it looks on gravity not as a force, but as part of the space-time fabric, which can be quantized. Information of a black hole imprinted on its surface, the event horizon. So this can also be described as the holographic principle. It seems to be some kind of compression algorithm of all of this information collected in a, in a highly distorted region of space-time, which is composed of the quanta of the gravitational field. Once we start to move away from that ultimate black hole, I'm talking as an analogy here, 
and gravity starts to appear in its more normal state, it, it achieves that granularity. So, so analogously, we can think of these diaconies as the sort of guardians around the black hole where, where the granularity of um, gravity starts to appear. In other words, as, as, as the beginning of where the structure of space and the structure of time and with that, the structuring of knowledge starts to appear. From the current edges of physics today, time and space is just one level, and beyond that, we have the amplitohedron. The amplitohedron, which has as its, as its physical, visual manifestation, looks exactly like the core of the Buddhist mandala. It's the center with the four quadrants, uh, four circles around it, infinitely, like the jewel net of Indra, infinitely, uh, expanding into an infinite and unending universe. So this is this is the cloud. This is the space in which information is endless. It's past, present, future in one. We're going beyond a kind of uh, linear time. We're going back, not even just into circular time. We've transcended time itself. With the Takine power, we can connect to the quantum field. And everything appears from the spaciousness. Everything appears from the the emptiness, so we can say we are, yeah, we are living in the Dakini pole. Some of the Hollywood movies uh, very much correspond with the Buddhist philosophy. So sometimes it can, from one, one point of view, you can look at like a matrix or matter of fact, uh, inception. <laughs> Everything in this world, I think, is uh, quantum physics, is beyond physics, I think. Even quantum also not enough for the Buddhist practitioner because we are called pranja paramita, you know, going beyond all the ideas and understand through the non dualistic mind, then we understand the emptiness. Guru Pema Sambhava, quantum physics and uh, shunyata, shunyata and quantum physics. How they explain about quantum physics. And in Buddhist world, how we explain shunyata. I think it, no choice not become more, more close. Generally, when we speak of science, at least as, as I understand it, we're speaking about a methodology. We're speaking of a way of trying to understand the nature of reality. Then we talk of quantum mechanics. We're talking about a level of operation, of functionality of the universe that actually goes beyond all of our current uh, categories of scientific thought. And what we're confronted by is as this with this irrationality uh, we're looking at intersecting probabilities we're looking at the ways in which consciousness is affecting outcomes of particular phenomena that are otherwise beyond predictability scientific um, study is uh, a form of inquiry that we've come up with uh, initially to explain the physical world so it's one of many tools in the toolbox that we have um, it's just and we've used it because um, it was useful to answer some of the easier questions, in a way, because those are observable phenomena. We haven't been able to answer a lot of questions around non-observable phenomena, like what is consciousness, um, what is imagination. Um, these are very important questions that science hasn't answered yet. It's difficult to put everything in science, actually, because I think that the problem with the scientists is that uh, they have their own barrier. They don't want to cross that. Anything they cannot explain, they don't want to explain. And this is where Prabhupada Sambhala guides us into this sort of quantum field, as it were, of our unrealized potential. Because if we don't realize it, then what we will manifest in the world could destroy us. But if we do manifest it, then what we manifest within our own being can save not just ourselves, but the planet from it an imminent dissolution. You know, if you listen to the earth, 
and respect, give her the respect that she deserves, maybe the weather wouldn't be so unpredictable You're because right. the earth is female. Guru Rinpoche is coming back. He's probably already amongst us. Guru Rinpoche physically never left. I think he's always around. Apply his teaching. Bama Sambhava is with us right now. With us every day. Guru Rinpoche is everywhere. Already here today. Yes. The Bhutan is the place where Guru Rinpoche is going to come back. If it is to happen, it will happen from Bhutan. Because uh, in the Himalayan world, I think we all consider Bhutan to be the burial of Guru Rinpoche.